My name is Master Shorty. I've been a recording artist for about seven years now. My opinion on global warming and climate change at this present moment is that I don't know enough, but what I do know is that it needs to be stopped. Latest scientific research suggests that we need to reduce our carbon emissions by 80% if we are to successfully combat climate change. Surprisingly, one of the industries leading this charge is the UK music industry. For changes to happen, it needed some of the music industry's biggest players to get involved. Two years ago, they all sat down for dinner at this restaurant to discuss climate change. The outcome was Julie's Bicycle an organisation dedicated to reducing the industry's carbon footprint. Hi, I'm president of AEG Live International Touring, organising tours globally. I'm Mario Stohai. I, I work for a company called Continental Clothing and we make T-shirts and supply the music industry. I'm a group director of Beggars Group, which is a record and publishing group. I'm John Webster, I'm a music manager and I also run the Music Managers Forum which is our trade body representing managers and their artists. My name's Alison Tickell and I am the director of Julie's Bicycle. When we first started we realised that the biggest problem that we had was actually we didn't know enough about the science of climate change as it related to the music industry. And so the very first thing we decided to do was to commission the Environmental Change Institute to scope the carbon emissions of the music industry for a full year. Lead researcher on the project was Catherine Bottrell, an energy and climate change researcher. Her work has been hugely influential in driving forward the organisation and she identified three major causes of the industry's emissions. Live music venues, audience travel and CD manufacturing. As part of her ongoing research, Catherine needs to visit music venues around the country to help assess how they could reduce their emissions. Venues account for 23% of the industry's greenhouse gas emissions. Hi, you must be Russell. Hey, Catherine. Welcome to Indigo. Come on in. Today, Catherine's come to the Indigo Club at the O2 on the day of a big gig to see what measures the newer venues like this have taken. Oh, what a great space, Russell. Yeah, this is our ground floor of Indigo. It's uh, got a capacity of 1,500, but the total capacity of the venue, we've got a, a balcony up above, is 2,450. How many um, gigs are you putting on in a week here at the Indigo? It varies, but we do about 170 shows a year. So it just depends on how busy the week is. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, why do you want to go take a look up on the stage? That'd be great. All right, let's go. Lighting is a huge part of many artists' live performances, but it also draws a huge amount of energy. Even at smaller venues such as these, there can be over 100 stage lights, including spotlights, washes, and strobes. This is the very light. Andy, could you just throw on the very light for me for a sec? Thumbs up. It has the ability to change its color yeah. and, and spin and turn, and it's all about how the lighting program would happen on the night. Yeah. But the great thing, as you can see, we've changed. Andy's changing the colors there for us to show a bit of the variety. How intensive is the stage lighting in terms of its energy use? Well, it depends on uh, obviously what the show demands and what they're, what they're doing with it. But this particular piece of equipment, we have 40 of them throughout the venue. And what we do is the bulb that we have in there, we don't use it to its capacity. Yeah. The wattage is a 1,500 watt bulb that would go in. So like compared to a uh, household life, a normal one, which is 60 watts, yes. that's quite... It's quite, quite a massive different. difference. But yeah. what we do is we run it at 900 watts rather than 1,500. So yeah. there's 600 watt savings per very light that we have. Yeah. So we're not running at full capacity. We sort of reduce it down and run it about sort of 60%. So we get a huge savings per night on that. So when you had the full sequence of lights on for the stage, it does create a, quite a big sort of spike in electricity during those few hours. The nature of the, the industry, uh, you're definitely with the, with the amount of lights and show that you're mm. putting on, you're, you'll get a spike from your day-to-day -day usage. Yeah. Um, again, uh, it's, it's part of the industry. What we try to do is find ways of reducing that wherever possible. Yeah. In regards to um, artists' performances in general and how they can cut down, you know, I'd love to say that it would be great to perform in pitch black, but unfortunately you need lights, and the more lights, the more people go home happy. Great. Okay. A high-performance sound system is a essential kit for any music venue. The system doesn't draw nearly as much energy as the lighting, 
but they've still found ways to reduce their energy consumption. We have um, quite a complex, um, what's called a line array system, yep. um, which is um, a system of arranging loudspeaker boxes in a certain pattern, yep. um, which allows you to use less power to project more sound. Yep, yep. So, so it, very effective at projecting yep. sound. Yeah, it machine. means using a lot less boxes, which means mm -hmm. there's a lot less amplifiers behind mm -hmm. them. And since amplifiers are about 1,000 watts each, the yep. less of them you have, obviously, yep. the yep. more efficient we are. Are there still innovations in terms of energy efficiency for sound um, currently coming into the industry? Absolutely. I mean, uh, this is, if, if we're really honest, um, it's a, it's a, it is just a posh computer. Yeah. You know, there really is just a PC behind this. Mm -hmm. PCs themselves are quite energy efficient. All the amplifiers have something which is called a switch mode power supply. If they're not being driven, as in they're not being required to do anything, yeah. um, they don't quite shut down, but they come much down to a sort of a standby operational mode yeah. when we have quiet times between the sound checks where there's nothing yeah. going on there's very little consumption along in those areas lighting and sound are big energy consumers but there are many other factors to consider such as air conditioning fridges and even the lifts russell takes catherine to one of the two plant rooms which house their electrical distribution so this is all for the electricity that's being used yep. within the venue? Yeah, it gives us a better idea of how it breaks down throughout the venue as well. What we do um, is, is pipe this information to a computer software program where we can better analyze it because we can do it half hourly, mm -hmm. hourly, whatever we want to set the parameters. The meters here measure the electricity in kilowatt hours, a unit of energy calculated by multiplying power in kilowatts by the number of hours used. It kind of gives you a better understanding of where you're pulling your information mm -hmm. when you're operational, but more importantly, when you're, when you're dark, mm -hmm. or when you're not in operation and there's nobody in the building, you can find out where you're wasting your energy. And so it gives you kind of the kilowatt hours of electricity, but taking that information, then you can calculate the carbon emissions of that electricity use. You can do, yeah, indeed. I mean, it can, that's the great thing about the software. It can break the information down, down in many different mm -hmm. ways. Obviously, what we're looking at the moment is, is the first step is reducing what we're using. Yeah. And then when we're looking at secondaries, how, how do we support that? I mean, we've got great infrastructure. We've got all our submeters in place. We've got the software to help read the information. Mm -hmm. Now we're making the education of decisions of how to improve our use of energy and how to reduce. One simple solution to reducing wasted energy could be found backstage. In the dressing rooms, they've installed motion sensors, so the lights only come on when people are in the room. Great. Upstairs in the VIP bar, they've introduced a number of energy-saving measures, such as LCD TV screens, dimmable spotlights, and LED lighting. And what type of features are in this space that are using energy? Yeah, we've got quite a bit of stuff going through here. Well, let's take a walk down. You'll see on your left-hand side as we walk up here, you'll see the LEDs that are hanging along the window sills. They're basically a cost-effective uh, um, uh, lamp solution. Mm -hmm. uh, so instead of running something that was a 60-watt bulb like you'd have mm -hmm. in your normal house, mm -hmm. we're running at sort of 2 or 3 watts. Mm -hmm. um, and they last a lot longer. So your shelf life is longer, but also you're using less energy. Lots of different colors. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, they can be programmed about five or six different colors, mm -hmm. depending on what the client wants, of course. Yeah. For the older music venues, making changes like these can be much harder as many of them were built before climate change was an issue. I'm fairly fortunate because I've developed and was involved in this building from day one, and so it's very modern, it's two years yeah. old. It'd be a lot more difficult for venues uh, that have been established for some time, because it'd be a lot more costly to make all these changes radically. Yeah. Yeah. But there's this proof that people can make through time, and uh, I will continue to look at uh, ways of improving and make this venue more energy efficient. As the band run through their final sound checks, the audience are beginning to arrive. Audience travel, the second factor on the emissions list, accounts for a whopping 43% of the industry's emissions. But it's a complex area to address. I think it's unfair to blame us for 43%. Oh, I don't, <laughs> but I don't, but that's the point, I don't think blame mm. helps. I don't, no, I don't think blame, blame helps. helps. But, I don't, but I also, I think it's a misleading statistic because mm. those people, if they weren't going to the um, concert, they'd be going to the match, they'd be going to yeah. the supermarket, they'd be going to the shop. I think there needs to be a balance here they without any it. panic okay. statistics, right. you know. Do you find the audience travel is changing? Do you think the public are changing their point of view and no, think no, they're not really? No, I mean, every city is different. Yeah. You know, every, every city, I mean, I could go through venues all over the world yeah. and, and talk about it, but every choice is made on convenience. We took the boat, actually. Uh, we actually came by car. By car, yeah. We got here by train, then bus. 
I came with friends. We got um, we drove, we went, we came in his car. I told you in two tubes. We've come by car. We've come all the way from Radler, the other side of London. How many miles? About, about two miles. Twenty minutes from here. About ten miles. At least ten miles. Came from Brixton, so it was about forty-five minute journey. Not too long. Although audience travel emissions can't be tackled by the music industry alone. Many of the newer venues are built close to tube or train stations to encourage the use of public transport. The third major point raised in Catherine's report was the emissions from the manufacturing of CDs, which accounts for 26% of total industry emissions. There are over 100 million CDs produced in the UK each year, and the manufacturing of a single CD results in the emission of 1.6 kilograms of carbon dioxide. That's a mind-blowing statistic. Yeah. You've got a CD that weighs a few grams, yeah. but 1.6 kilograms of carbon yeah. Yeah. have been and emitted in the process of that one CD. It's terrifying. And also the, the packaging is a third of that. We did a big piece of research across in record shops all over the country and we found that people really do prefer card. If you change your CD plastic jewel case from plastic to yeah. card, when you purchase your CD, you can reduce your emissions in the package by up to 95%. We don't have time to wait five, six, seven years for CDs to disappear. And if we can start to show climate leadership in our industry on CDs, we'll do it. Yeah, I do buy CDs, sometimes I do, but um, I buy just MP3s of iTunes as well, it's much yeah. cheaper and easier. Um, I buy about at least 10 CDs a year. I personally don't buy CDs at all anymore. We now have our iPods, so it's really unnecessary. And they're like quite expensive now compared to 7 to 9 people at all. I haven't bought CDs for a long time, actually. While the future may be geared towards music downloads, this will bring with it a whole set of new emissions challenges as the music is stored on huge computer servers. Of course, the big solution there is actually to, to make sure that the data storage, which is, which is going to be by a long way uh, the biggest impact and will be very significant in terms of um, digital downloads, will be using not fossil fuel-based um, energy, but renewable. The only long-term solution that I can see to this problem is looking at how this electricity is generated yeah. mm -hmm. and you know if you can use clean electricity that has no carbon footprint mm -hmm. then you can have however extravagant uh, staging you want mm -hmm. the music industry has um, this very very loud global voice mm -hmm. and perhaps part of that voice could be used f to advocate uh, the move to sustainable e electricity, mm -hmm. to sustainable energy generation. The thing about Judy's Bicycle, we said a lot of the past music business things I've been involved in, there's been a bunch of us running around not quite knowing what, you know, knowing much about it, but we've seen it on the news and something's got to be done about it. So, hey, something's got to be done about this, and we yeah. don't fully understand it. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas it's great that this marriage between science and our industry has come together yeah. so we can actually be guided yeah. and be told what yeah. to do rather yeah. than have big mouths. The continuing research being carried out on climate change by people like Catherine is crucial not only to the music industry, but in our understanding of what is already the most pressing issue of this century.